It's not important. <laughs> Trust me, I'll do it.
We ask that the mayor to initiate and carry out in conjunction with the government a major review of how the county was structured and operates and make the necessary changes to give us a fit for purpose governance and management structure for our city. Well, I point out that in this, it's the structure that's made your problem, not so much the people that are having to put up with it and make it work, and that has to change. Also, the current have a say consultation process needs a major overhaul to be relevant. The second is for social housing for seniors, is very much in the spotlight at the moment, both because of the rapidly increasing numbers of seniors predicted in the decade ahead, as well as the management structure of effectiveness of Kalmara. The, the council will joint venture with the Selwyn Foundation that's currently running all the pension units. Uh, and they've had a, a particular problem uh, following the tragic death of their residents, which you all know about. So that's under review as well. Current council policy is to hold senior housing at existing levels and to sell off part of the existing senior court sites to finance the refurbishment and redevelopment of existing units. Great right power policy is the council has a greater focus on the housing needs of the senior community and specifically to have all the current senior court sites fully retained and not sold off. And for council to have a more proactive role in the provision of senior social housing is the overall need is growing rapidly. And so we would hope that the candidates will all support this point of view. So it's now down, down to business, uh, show time. So Mayor Phil Golf will be off, followed by John Tamahiri and Craig Lord. Uh, Phil. <coughs> Um, thank you very much, Bill Rayner, uh, President of uh, Great Power North Shore. And to ladies and gentlemen, welcome along. Uh, I've talked to you last time, I've talked to you I think a couple of times since, uh, and uh, it's always good to see the number of people that you turn out here and the interest that you have. The big challenge we have is getting the young people out to take an interest and, uh, uh, and to vote. Uh, but you know, if you look at the voting rates, I think amongst uh, those of us that are over 65, it's about 80 and for the younger people, uh, 18 to 28, you, you, you're probably down to about 15, 20 percent. Uh, and that's a real pity. We need to get our young people out. The world that we're working to build at the moment is the world that they inherit from us. And our responsibility, actually, in, in this generation is the nature of the, the world that we leave to them. Uh, we've got some big challenges ahead of us in this city, uh, but I want to start off by saying this is a fantastic city to live in. Uh, I was born and bred in Auckland. Uh, I've lived here all my life. I was down three nights a week uh, in exile in Wellington in my time in Parliament. Uh, but I've always kept my home here and I've uh, raised the kids and now seen the grandkids raised in Auckland. And let's just celebrate to begin with the things that make this city a really, really good place to live in. Uh, we have a beautiful environment with our harbour, our islands, our reserves, uh, our, you know, Hoonora and Waitakere's, uh, um, just the nature of the place that we live in, having clean air that we can breathe, almost clean air. It'd be great to have clean water as well, and I'll put real emphasis on cleaning up our harbours, because every time it rains, our stormwater flows into our wastewater, and our wastewater flows into our harbour and onto our beaches. Over in Takapuna Beach, we've had problems with ancient infrastructure, uh, just not coping. And we've done a huge amount of work with CCTV cameras, with uh, smoke tests, etc. Uh, literally spending uh, millions of dollars so that we can clean up our beaches, so that our beaches are fit to swim in at any time. And instead of the 30-year plan that I inherited to clean that up, we'll do it uh, in less than 10 years. And that's something, that is the birthright for us as Aucklanders and what we owe to our grandkids uh, and to generations to come. Secondly, um, because of the growth that we're getting, let's work out what the growth is. Auckland grows more in population each year than the rest of the country put together. We've got 55% of the whole country's growth each year. So I tell people in Wellington, if they want New Zealand to succeed, Auckland's got to succeed. And I know that there are some people that talk about us as Aucklanders as Jaffers, and I'd like to think that was just another friendly Aucklander. Apparently, the F stands for something less polite than that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, we have to succeed as a city because we are contributing a huge amount to this country. And uh, we want to make sure that we get the support that we need from central government. 
we might not be the majority of the country, but we've got the majority of the growth of the country, and we, we produce uh, uh, products and goods for this country disproportionately to our population numbers. So what is the pressure of population? We, we're still growing by about 40,000 people a year. So take the city of Tauranga, that's a pretty big, uh, one, one of our bigger cities. We add the city of Tauranga every three years to Auckland. And that puts challenges on for our transport, it puts challenges on for our housing, and it puts pressure on our environment. What are we doing about transport? First of all, massive underinvestment in infrastructure and transport. Not just uh, uh, that, you know, in the last five or six years, but actually over a long period of time. I succeeded this year, in the in the last year I should say, in the, the 10 year budget, in negotiating with government for them to lift our Auckland Transport Alone project, that's our investment in transport for the next 10 years, to 28 and now it's $29 billion. $29 billion, and the central government will be paying 19 of that, and we've got to put in the other 10. So what have we seen? We all know what a great success the North Shore uh, bus lanes were. I was in the cabinet when we made that decision, and people said, no, people on the shore won't travel by buses. More than half of the people coming from, from the shore into town now are travelling by bus, because it is such a great and reliable and quick service. So we're extending the North Shore busway, uh, taking it up to Albany, we'll ultimately go up to Orewa. Uh, we're building new stations um, uh, and park and rides along them so that people can use them better. We're creating new busways out in the east of Auckland because we have to cater for the whole of Auckland. That's another $1.4 billion project, I think. It's huge. Uh, we are creating, of course, the city rail link, which doesn't directly impact on, on the shore unless you want to, once you get into town, you want to go somewhere else but that will double the capacity of rail uh, and that's going to make a huge difference to, to, to unclogging the congestion in Auckland as well. Uh, we've created a new light rail and when the busways are full up on the shore, you will end up with light rail. There's some talk about building, uh, actually, the John Tomahiri's policy just released, wanting to build a 10 lane, traffic lane, harbour bridge with eight more lanes on it for trains, etc. John, you say that's $100 million. I've got to tell you, it's more likely to be $10 billion. And if you build a 10-lane traffic motorway over the bridge, you have to have 10 lanes at either end to feed people onto it and take people off it, and you'd be destroying homes by the thousands, buildings, uh, and neighbourhoods. And, you know, I'm not coming before you today to promise what can't be delivered. Uh, I've been in government as a minister for 15 years, never got sacked as a minister, John. Um, and I know, I know how the system works and I know what you can do and I know that there's only one place where you can get money from to do these projects. Guess, guess where that, what that place is? Yeah, yes. yeah you've got it. You as ratepayers and taxpayers. So we've got to be, we've got to find that balance between doing the things that we need to create infrastructure and not hammering you with your rates uh, and with your taxes. And I made the promise three years ago in this room I said I would keep the average general rate increase to 2.5%. It was uh, scheduled to be higher than that, and I've kept that promise. I've kept that promise, and at the same time, we have put record amounts of money into investment into the infrastructure we need. Now, that wasn't easy. To give you an idea of the 2.5% average general rate increase, Hamilton this year is putting its rates up by, anybody know? 9.7%. More in one year, then we've put it up by uh, in, in more than three. It's a great city, it's got its challenges like we have. But that's too tough on you and I'm not about to do that. I went back to you and I asked you whether you wanted to do more on water quality and the environment. We got submissions in, we did polling through Polmark Brunton. Guess what you told me? Yes, we don't mind putting a couple of bucks on our rates to pay for cleaning up our water and for enhancing our environment, stopping that spread of coal-free dieback that's going to wipe out an iconic tree. And the same with Colmar Brunton. Three to one, people said to us, get on and do it. That's the right thing to do, and we're doing that. And that's why we can clean the, the harbours up 20 years ahead of time. That's why we're investing a whole lot more in stopping coral dieback, wiping it out. It's why we're trying to protect our native bird species from predators, uh, and we're doing a great job on that. We want to recreate some of the things that we have lost. Housing was another big problem, and I talked about that last time here. We were, we were consenting 
back in 2009-10, uh, about 3,500 houses a year. This year, we have consented 14,000 houses in the year to July uh, of 2019. That's a five-fold, four-fold increase. And we need more houses to meet the demand, otherwise the price of houses keep going up. And we're okay in this room, most of us own our own homes. But what about our kids? How many of you have got kids here in this room that you had to help with your mortgages? I, I reckon just, yeah, just about everybody. It's called the bank of mum and dad. And if, if, if your kids aren't in a position where you can help them, the chances were that they weren't going to get home ownership. So we need to build the number of houses that are needed, and we're starting to do that. 14,000 houses a year, more in the first six months of this year than we built in the 24 months from beginning of 2009 to the end of 2010. Homelessness. You don't have to go very far to see homelessness around the city, and I'm chairing a group called Housing First. And something I'm really proud of, in the last two and a bit years, we have housed over a thousand people out of emergency housing, out of sleeping in cars and some of them off the streets. And you, know, you really want to know the hard facts of this, nearly half of those people were kids. I remember seeing that story about that young girl sleeping in a van and when they said to her, what's the terrible thing about that? She says, well I can't have the light on at night because it runs down the battery and I can't do my homework. This was a kid sleeping in a van, and there was a kid wanting to get on, do the right things at school. There should be no place in our society for homelessness. And it's not an easy job to solve, but I am proud of that thousand people working with five different housing agencies that we've got out of the vans, out off the streets, out of emergency housing, and into homes. I want to just say this as well. How can we do all of the things we need to do without putting more and more burden on you. There's a couple of thoughts I've got here. One is to push government as hard as we can to make sure that they pay their share. And one of the things that, um, you know, we was making an announcement yesterday, and we we're getting money out of government for this project and that project and the other project. That's good, but actually what we need is revenue sharing. Central government saying, we created this super city, but we forgot to provide you with the revenue sources. We pretended you were still 29 different borough councils. Well, that's not good enough. And I was working on a submission yesterday that we're putting down to the Productivity Commission to say we need that devolution of funding. And guess what? My best idea is for every dollar that council levies on rates, the government levies another 15 cents. And where does that go? It doesn't come back to us. It goes in the government's pocket. So why doesn't the government return the GST they put on our rates back to local government? It'd be worth $270 million to the city a year. And Bill English didn't like the idea, and I've got to say, Grant Robinson hasn't been very forthcoming either, but I will keep on fighting for that until we get it. Because if you're going to create a super city, Bill, you talked about, you know, the structure's not being right. The first structure, you've got to get right, is the revenue for it. But the second thing we have been able to do is find efficiencies. When they created those six different council-controlled organisations, they each did their own thing. They ran their own finance, their own insurance, their own procurement. We have saved $280 million by bringing those together into one and saying you will have joint procurement. We slashed the cost of insurance for the cover that we've got by using the bargaining power we had of the council and the six organisations together. And I have built in, this is not fantasy stuff, I have built into the 10-year budget savings of $1 billion that we will find through efficiencies. And we are on track to finding that in the first two years. And I'm proud of that. Now, there are two things that you wanted me to talk about. Let me try and remember what they were. The first was the structure, the structure of council. It's 10 years next year from the time that we set up the super city. So I support your recommendation to do a full review particularly of the CCOs. Because I know that there is legislation, for example, on Auckland Transport that says, council cannot control any operational decision of Auckland Transport. And that means that the power rests in the, the CCO, and it should, when, when you give power to somebody, there's gotta be responsiveness and accountability. And I'm not satisfied with the level of responsiveness and accountability, though we've made some really important changes uh, in order to increase 
that, that accountability back to council, but also back to you. And while I'm not meant to do it, is that a one minute deal? Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we're making some differences in that area, and I want to sh ensure that there is that accountability. Auckland Transport had plans to change the traffic layout in St. Helios recently. 600 people turned up at a meeting because they didn't think it was the right thing to do. But guess who wasn't there? Auckland Transport. And I blew them up. I've been, no, I have been down to see them. You're absolutely wrong, John. You know, I do turn up at meetings. You turned up at 20% of the meetings when you're on council on finance and performance. One meeting in five. So we will have that review. We will have that review and we will be making changes. The second thing and the last thing that I'm going to finish on is social housing. Unfortunately, there was a, previous, a predecessor of mine, his name was John Banks, he sold off all of the pensioner units that Auckland Council had. But fortunately the North Shore didn't, and Monaco didn't, and Waitakere didn't. But it means that we only have 1,400 rather than probably several thousand units to deal with, and those units are in appalling condition. We are now replacing them, unit by unit. But we are replacing them by using the land that we've got better and selling some of that land to pay for the cost of it. We are committed to retaining that. I will not privatise social housing, nor will I privatise water care. Uh, and we will gradually work to build up that number, but we will also work with government to get more social housing. Because as more and more people retire on limited incomes, without savings, there will be more demand. So I support in principle what you're calling for there, but we'll do it in a slightly different way. Thank you very much for your time and your attention today. Cheers. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome, John. <coughs> um, I just want to correct the record because when you're um, in an election campaign, people can be very scary with the truth. So, um, Mr. Goff, Mr. Goff has said about the stack. If you are uh, in the election campaign you know, once more and lie, I'm going to sue you. Okay, because, because, because I've got to tell you, I, got to tell you um, I can't have people. Uh, you, we must concentrate on the issues and the substance. Okay, we can get into smear campaigns and we can get into one another and all that stuff. That gets us nowhere. The reason why Christine Fletcher and I are a partnership is because people like Phil Goff and others, they go left, they go right, and Auckland gets left right out of everything. <laughs> and so what we've done is uh, form a great partnership, and a partnership of a new form of leadership for the city. Now my, our pledge card is very simple to start off with. The first thing we'll do is open the box and cut the waste. If you don't think that there's a bloated bureaucracy just across the bridge here, there's something wrong. The second thing that we wanted to do, apart from cutting the waste, is to devolve more resources to local communities. It's all been centralised downtown. Again, to faceless, unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats. And the arrogance that has started to permeate from the top all the way through is an unacceptable form of conduct that any citizen should have visited on them. And that culture just has to change. And that culture runs from the top. And we're going to put more public back into the service downtown here and elsewhere. And under, you see, here's the problem with um, uh, people born today and under this form of leadership. They don't understand respect for elders. In all good communities and great societies, that is one of their greatest hallmarks. In, in the day that we start to uh, give that up, we start to normalise the abnormal. I'll come to social housing shortly because I'm just thinking to deal for 75 one-bed social houses for the elders in Henderson. But I know how to develop, I know exactly what the resource consents are. We're just finishing 120 houses in Waterview, social houses. Those houses, I've got a little more houses than this guy and Phil Twyford in the last two years. That's just a, a mathematical fact. And I need you to know that because our social housing is going to become extraordinarily important in the next 25 years, particularly with our elders. Longevity is kicking in 
assets are going down, rates are going up. Under this mayor, if you re-elect them, 18% is what your rates have gone up over six years. 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. He says 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, and that's just on the general rate. That is not taking into account the spouse taxes. He comes back from Wellington with his mates with 11 and a half cents a litre per petrol only on Aucklanders. If that tax was levied on every other city, we could accept it. But why penalise Aucklanders uh, on 11 and a half cents a litre when no other city has applied to them? And why accept that? That's just poor leadership and it's selling out to Wellington. And one thing I won't be is a puffer to Wellington. Mr. Goss talked about GST. He won't take the war to bring GST back to Auckland. Because he had 40 years to do it in Wellington and didn't even mention it once in one debate. You know, I had the displeasure of being in the same party for six years in Parliament. What torture. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to so so say to you is, as we start to embark on this campaign, ladies and gentlemen, come on, let's start to wake up. Let's start to stand up for the city. Let's start to stand up for some of the attributes and the values upon which the city was based and this country is underwritten. Now, the next particular policy is to implement an integrity unit. When you've got a balance sheet, that is, you add the 18 top stock companies in the New Zealand Stock Exchange together, and Auckland City's balance sheet is bigger than all of them put together. The amount of money tuning around down there is between five and a half and six billion dollars per annum. This is not a little business. It cannot be overseen by a mayor that's never run a business, never employed 250 employees like I do, and built a business. Auckland has to be run by a business and like a business, and it's got to be run strongly. The CCOs, they are out of control. Auckland Transport, I've already made a commitment, that whole board gets sacked. You know the city, you know the city, this city is the city, this city is the city of snails, not the city of sails. This, I want, I invite you to go to my website, jtformayor.co.nz. You will see the Mayor's Design Champion caught on video in Cape Town and in Singapore. Go to my video, go to my website, and listen to him. He says this. He says, what we're going to do is we're going to take four lanes and we're going to bring them down to two. He says, we're going to stop left-hand turns. Right? Three left-hand turns are over. He says, we're going to resequence the lights to frustrate the motorists. He says, we're going to drop speed limits all over town to frustrate the person in the car. He says we're going to build jar bars everywhere. <coughs> now this is about a war on people in cars. Now I get intuitively that we should migrate out of them. But where to? Where to when you've got a guy like Dengis Khan, cut loose by the present mayor, to make war on every motorist? I do invite you to go and have a look at it. It's in his words, not mine. His words, not mine. Here's the elephant in the room and the biggest difference between us in leadership terms. If we don't sort Wellington out, Wellington continues to hold Auckland in a headlock. We pay provisional tax. We pay GST. We pay ACC. We pay petrol levies on top of it. We've paid for the rebuild of Christchurch, of Kaikoura, the fix up in Wellington. We, as Aucklanders, have paid for that. The Provincial Growth Fund, $3 billion a year, not one cent is allowed to come to Auckland. We pay for that. We have to start to stand up against Wellington. Now, here's the, here's the problem we've got. People get on planes from Auckland, out of our Auckland constituencies, and forget where their obligations and duties and responsibilities lay. Central government right now can borrow at 1.4% over 10 years, billions of dollars. 
never has it been lower. Its head space is significant. And yet Aucklanders are double tax and triple tax. On the petrol tax and everything else that I've just mentioned are all the way through. And yet they want us to pay 50% of our own infrastructure. And here's the problem with Phil saying that. Phil doesn't have, doesn't, uh, was very strong on the numbers. But the pr problem with that is it's actually 65% that we pay. They claw back the rest with GST. So on every capital program that all from transport pays or anything in the town, uh, we're paying 65% or 100% of it. And that just has to stop. This transition occurred in the late 80s. Uh, uh, post Second World War, remember it was uh, the great Ministry of Works that did all the infrastructure. And then the houses were built and everybody had a train track to get to and a road to drive on. He's consented thousands of houses but no roads to get them out of or to places anywhere. Now that is some of the worst planning we've seen ever. Consents do not lead to building. Consents are just consents. And if you're in development, you'll know exactly what that means. And a number of uh, projects are no longer underway. So I, make, I want to make it very clear that you've got a very clear choice in a contest. The Labour Party swapped him out for Brown. There was no contest last election. There was no contest of ideas. The turnout today is magnificent. And it's magnificent because there's a, a contest on. And what a great democracy that is when that happens. Now if you let some people in a darkened room in Wellington determine who should be the mayor of Auckland, that should just never happen. Talk about the Max and the Labour Party and the ruling council thought. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying right now that it's just a despicable little act in the way in which this person be positioned. And I ain't gonna toss, because at the end of the day, you are the second stupid and you'll know exactly how to vote on the day when your voting packs come. Alright? And so I'm grateful for you uh, coming out. I've just announced today a he says that we'll look at a second crossing or a third crossing or a channel for that. Uh, come 2030. Now, put your hand up if you think you're going to be around by then. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't know that that's going to be true, but what I can tell you, what I can tell you is the North Shore needs a solution, and today my campaign team delivered it. And he can bag it for all he likes. Another, another mistruth, misspoken, or whatever he wants to put it, is I never put a dollar value on that, on the rebuild of the Auckland Harbour Bridge. And I'll tell you why I did it. Uh, because even though he's got control of the city downtown, he's delivered the largest budget blowout in the history of local government politics in New Zealand, $1 billion in April of this year. Don't talk to me about numbers, don't talk to me about reliability, and don't talk to me about integrity. Yeah, and, and you heard that, and a month later, it looks like it could go north another 600 million. Who's going to pay that? Who's going to pay that? So what I've had to do is rebuild the balance sheet of the city. And to do that, I've announced the sale of the port. The, the port business, not the 77 hectares of land. Land can never be replaced. Land is our, our, is our public food, is our mother. Should never sell your mother, not, not special and sacrosanct lands. So, those being 77 hectares, they will be leased back to the port. The port will be offered for sale. They cooked the books this year, they borrowed $36 million, and he knows it to pay the dividend he demanded of them, and they've just come back for another $150 million for automation. Now, my, in my other um, uh, announcement on that port, is that we will congestion charge trucks out of the city uh, over the working hours, normal working hours from 7 to 7. 50% of the truckies accepted that, 50% didn't, but we can work on it. We can't outbuild everything with infrastructure, so we've got to spread the volume on our network 
and so congestion charging will occur. And that's just uh, you know, change behaviors. So that's the port, and that's a prudent thing to do, and it's a business model everywhere in the world. On water care. Water care by law is not allowed to pay a dividend. Water care, we don't know because it still charges you three separate charges that look at your bill. We don't know whether those charges are prudent and appropriate, but what I do know is we've got $10 billion tied up in the balance sheet and the citizens cannot get to that equity and the citizens cannot use it. I've said that we can part release that equity by releasing 49% and who to? It will be the ACC Investment Fund or New Zealand Super Fund. It's still your money. It's still your money. It's still your asset that we're releasing the money. Where will it go? I don't know whether what he says about fixing the beaches will work. What I know is I can show you the currency and the money to make it happen. And we'll fix those beaches up. And we'll sort the shore out in, in the first instance as part of that. Do go to my website in terms of the announcement that I've made to put Penlink on steroids and to push uh, from Westgate north to Kumu and then into Wapuru. It just has to happen. The, the, the stranglehold in the north of the city uh, is just a disgrace. The requirement to bring solace to the North Shore and, and businesses and investors to the North Shore by ensuring that we know that we've got an alternative that can take a lot more traffic in and out of the shore and, and across the other side of town is imperative. Don't wait till 2030. Let's have the decision in the next three years as grown ups. As I conclude, I'll say this. Uh, across the whole of the city, the next three years will be a reset and a refresh. The legislation will be reviewed. Citizens will be consulted, but consulted properly not by predetermination from Mr. Goff's bureaucrats who come out, everything is predetermined. You, you get thrashed to heck in terms of the feedback that you give. And ultimately, when it's done, it comes back the way it comes back, which is the way the bureaucrats designed it in the first place. That's not a consultation process, ladies and gentlemen. That's out of control bureaucrats. Now, finally, on Christine Fletcher, this mayor sacked her and sacked Mike Lee from the Auckland Transport Board. While they were on that board, the rights of the citizens were protected. The day he removed them is the day, is the day whoever produces orange cones made a billion dollars. Okay? <laughs> That's what happened. So I'm just saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking back control of our city. You've got a chance to make that work. And I want you to get your kids out and your grandkids out and get them to value the money and the vote to have a go at their democracy. And we, we can't deliver a mayoral person to the mayoral benches on a 38% vote. It's just unacceptable in terms of what we practice and preach and honour every Anzac day. So I'm putting it to you. Do go home, get your kids to vote. I'd like to think that they'll vote for me. If they didn't, they'd be pretty silly. What I want to say, what I want to say is, you know, get them up and get them out into, uh, into it and uh, let's have a great election, have a good look at the contest uh, and I wish you all the best and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Tom. You remember my name, Bill? Now, uh, before I start, Bill has suggested and given me permission to actually explain who I am, which leads perfectly into when he couldn't introduce me before. And I'm going to do it off my notes because it's important I tell you everything I possibly can in this small time frame. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Craig Lord. Who, you say? And to be fair, you are right, because I shouldn't even be here. The reason I say that is because mainstream media have announced multiple times on their own accord with no actual empirical evidence or data that this year's mayoral race is only two horses. 
So allow me to introduce myself and tell you why I think they are undeniably wrong. I am a 47-year-old former engineer and currently a freelance media operator. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a university graduate. I'm the guy that grew up in small town Patadaru. I went to fifth form at Tauranga Boys College, grew up there, and then I left school at the end of fifth form to be the boy in an engineering workshop that specialised in hydraulics and pneumatics. At 16, I didn't even know what hydraulics and pneumatics were, let alone spell it. But I knew it was a workshop, and I knew it's where I wanted to be. I saw a tiny ad in the Herald, which is how we all found jobs back then, right? And this little ad said, school lever wanted for workshop. My dad was an engineer, my brother still is. So I ran, I was given a time to come in, and I hopped on my motorbike at 16 years old and rode from Tauranga to Auckland for my interview. I then went to visit my sister, who was already living in Auckland. So I gave them her phone number. No cell phones back then either. Then, bang, they rang, and that day they offered me the job. So I had to make a call. Dad, I'm moving to Auckland. And that was part one of my adult life. I got on with it, and since I had spent my entire life to that time in the world of scouting, since my dad was a scout leader, my entire family grew up in the lifestyle, and since I was now in a big city with no contacts, I decided to find a scout group in Auckland, and my new boss happened to know his local, so he introduced me. And whoa, did my life change from there. You see, I was only 17, and the most I could do due to age was become an assistant leader with the Cubs. That was okay, I could still help. But the most important thing was that the group leader, I soon found out, had a daughter. <laughs> well, I met this girl when I was 17, and she was smitten by the little country boy who had moved to big, bad Auckland all by himself to take on the world. That daughter, who ended up with her Duke of Edinburgh and Queen Scout Awards, has been by my side now for 30 years. We've been married for 23. We've raised two wonderful children to become two pretty awesome adults at times, 21 and 17, and now both of them are out there in the working world as well. Like my dad, I carried on to become a scout leader, then the group leader. While at work, I continued to move up the ranks in the engineering game. By the mid-20s, I was workshop foreman and head technician. I was designing building, repairing factory automation machinery, and by 30, the owner of the company made me general manager. By then, I could spell hydraulics and pneumatics. But then I said it was time for a leap. I went out on my own and secured a massive contract to design and build 13 machines that would make metal framing for houses. I was on my way. Then, disaster. Unknown to me, the company I built them for had a deceitful plan from day one. We finished the machines, successfully tested half of them before we called it a day, wished everyone a happy Easter and we'll see them on Tuesday. Over that four day weekend, all planned out, they packed the machines into containers and shipped them to Texas. The entire lot without paying the balance of the job. Long story short, my company went into receivership. And just as I was about to lose the house and be declared bankrupt, the receivers, we still don't know how, managed to get the money owed. It was only the amount that enabled me to pay the creditors, which was fantastic, but it was too late for my company. A year had gone by, I lost my business to rogues. I'd taken on three jobs to survive. We had at that time our two children under five. I refused to declare bankruptcy. I punched my way out of it, learned a lot about this harsh world. But then there was another change of foot. I said, enough of the tools now. I went a completely different path and moved into media. It was a complete flip around in lifestyle and occupation. And my wife said to me, what is freelance media? And I said, not sure, but we do all sorts of little things and charge people independently for jobs. Her response to that 
was understandable. But I was determined, and that's how I do things. I jump in the deep end. It's Sir Richard Branson who famously said, say yes, then work out how to do it later. I've spent the last 16 years as an event MC, a motorsport commentator, magazine editor, journalist, photographer, TV presenter at Sky and Prime, film producer at Radio Sport and News Talk ZB. I learned on the go, taught myself a new trade, but my solid engineering background has never left me. So with all of those different life-affecting moments, I have certainly learned a lot. With a mix of adversity and general life, my wife, and like many of you here, have gone through the struggles of raising a family in Auckland. We understand the difficulties. My wife and I had to tighten the purse strings many times, so we know how to sacrifice. I can apply all of those life lessons to a new role. In June last year at a barbecue, one of those conversations that leads to bickering over politics, one of my mates said to me, you should be mayor, mate. We laughed it off. But then we spoke some more and I did some analysis and realised that with my particular skills, I'd actually be a really good man because I'm willing to do it differently. Here we go again, says my wife. However, I truly do believe I understand what the role actually is. That being, it is not a dictatorship as the other candidates make it out to be. It's a leadership role. It is also a spokesperson position. Token is too light of a description, but who does the media turn to when they want a sound bite from an event, a corporation, a business, or a group? A spokesperson. It's a major part of the mayor's job. I also look at Chris Farfoy, who Phil would know well, given he was his press secretary, who was arguably, at the moment, the only current minister doing a good job in the Beehive and achieving results. He simply came into politics after being a journalist. Knowing this, I'm quite possibly also the only mayoral candidate in history that doesn't have policies. Yes, I have some dreams and goals, but no policies, and you may be wondering why and how I can say such things, as Phil chuckles off my side. <laughs> it's simply because, he won't be laughing shortly, <laughs> policies are for central party policy politics, where a party has a set, set list of items that every MP gets in behind. This is local body, 21 votes on a council, 21 different people voted in who have a vast difference of opinions and goals, but 21 people who need to work together on those ideas and find the best solutions for everyone. The Mayor is only one of those 21, and therefore should be working with the 20 councillors in a unified manner to make the city better. If a Mayor comes in shouting policies, then they are arrogantly stating to the other 20 councillors, this is what we are doing, and that is wrong. In saying this, we are all well aware in politics that election bribes get attention and votes, and the people that shout and spout might possibly maybe follow up on them, but it's a well-used ploy that long-term politicians use, and that's why I'm quite happy to not be one. I do have those dreams and goals, though. I want to fix the internals of a very broken machine that being the many different council operations internally and externally. I want to use my fault finding skills and communication skills to get to the bottom of our excessive and unnecessary spending on so many levels of operation. Not where we get the money from, where we are spending it. And as I said before, I know how to tighten purse strings and make sacrifices and Auckland needs exactly that. To fix a machine, you analyse its components, you study it, you work out what's gone wrong, you decide on a plan, and you repair it. You may need to bring in specialists from time to time. And let me give you an example using this pen. This pen was made by an injection moulding machine. When broken, I was the guy that Bic called in. 
I would diagnose and fix this machine. And if it was electrical, would I go off and bring in some extraordinarily high-priced consultant to come and tell me how to fix the electrical bit? No. I would find a Sparky that had worked in the game for years, who understands the problem and has the experience to assist me with solutions. Quite simply, you work out what bits are broken or no longer required, you remove or repair the faulty part, and you upgrade it if must be. A failing business is exactly the same process. So too is the council operations. We are spending in the wrong places. We need to get back to core services. We need to focus on the needs of the people and not let your money be siphoned away on vanity projects and nonsensical wants by a selected few with their hands in the cookie jars. Take Chamberlain Park, for example. $30 million? And there's no genuine or urgent need to spend your money on that change. RFA wants to chuck millions into modifying Western Springs. And again, there's no genuine need to do it. There are so many examples of your money going into niceties rather than necessities. Half a million dollars for a statue in Mount Eden rather than Rodney Road repairs? And let's not forget, someone in council operations paid consultants and contractors $180,000 to install a mirror above O'Connell Street. I've been there and I looked up. That's a $5,000 job. That's a lot of money blowing. Your money. Those are just a few examples of many. I do want to spend money. I won't lie to you about that. But on wonderful things. Like a waste to energy plant. Cone parking systems at the park and ride instead of sprawling out our car parks. Just two examples of many. We need to find the money to do such things, but I actually reckon it's there. If we sacrifice other unnecessary things for the greater good. This is where all of those points come back directly to you. I was asked about the particular items relevant to you. Rates really for seniors, support for senior organisations, support in regards to hospital parking. And I say yes to all of those. I will gladly take those to council and lobby for them on your behalf. I agree wholeheartedly that our population growth is too fast. We can no longer cope. And unless it has somehow slowed down, we are in crisis mode. It's another task I will gladly take on with, fellow, with help from fellow councillors, because that is part of the mayor's job. It would be my job to listen to what you want. And quite simply, council should be doing what you want. I was also asked to discuss with you about my thoughts on the council structure, the CCOs, the selling of assets connected to council, social housing, and seniors and their place in the community. All of those points have issues, so how could I not support trying to fix them with you and for you? But I need your help, because I can't assume what you need. I can't stand up here and tell you what you need. You are the experts. You are the specialists I bring in to fix the machine. <coughs> Nearly done. You are the people. Council and boards are the elected representatives of the people. We simply get think tanks together. We make sure you are represented as a community and you are directly part of all decision-making processes. You tell us what is best for you and then we get on with trying to make it happen. In regards to the CCOs, well, due to them having no elected representation, they have become bullies with no accountability to the public. We are all aware of how our current mayor removed councillors from the AT board, and after all the bad PR, he recently promised a thorough analysis of failing CCOs if he gets back in mayor. Why then? Why not just do it now? My bad, I forgot. That's how election bribes work. It's deceitful how AT is making city congestion worse on purpose. It's been done to force people out of personal transport. Panuku, being the land developer, and RFA, being empire builders, are doing whatever they want in regards to the creation of their realms. They have cast community groups aside, kicked them out of parks, buildings, halls, no remorse for doing it. Ineffective and disconnected, 
Those are the two terms Grey Power have used to describe the current level of interaction between council and the community. In particular, and rightfully so, your community. The city should therefore do two things. One, ensure you are still part of it, and two, ensure you are still part of it. Things do need to change. Change comes about with a change in culture. You change culture not by being a dictator, but by being a leader. You lead with the standards you expect. This current council is split. It has no unity, no desire to work together. The leadership has failed. Auckland voters have no confidence in council and seemingly little pride about their city, desperately looking for a leadership option. There have been none on display until now. My name is Craig Lord. Thank you for your time. Uh, we'll now sort of start moving to questions, and I'll probably reshuffle them a bit. Uh, we've got three core questions. One was the rating of the for seniors, the grandfather, support for senior organisations, and the hospital parking costs support from uh, Auckland Transport Parking Revenue. So I'll probably start on the hospital parking cost, that's probably relevant uh, right now. We've got high parking costs at the North Shore Hospital, a continuing burden in public concerns. Great Power North Shore proposes that Auckland Transport should be involved in the offsetting of hospital parking costs with the revenue they gain from the street and parking building charges in the city which is growing rapidly. The basic North Shore hospital charges now are basically the same as charge in the civic centre down in the, uh, the, the centre of town. So would you support this concept? And as a follow to that, we've actually put forward in our submissions that we do that the Auckland Council should take over the complete parking situation for Auckland. One, it's a revenue earner of some magnitude, and secondly, with the Wilsons and the Porno and the past, it's a completely shonky operation and needs sort of proper regulatory control. So probably start with, with John, could you comment on that? If you just... First issue. Um, of course, um, any elders uh, heading into hospitals, there's just got to be some relief. How we um, tool that and fashion that uh, is yet to be determined because I um, looked at it over the last week and wasn't able to come up with a uh, binding solution to give you satisfaction. But in principle, uh, you don't go to hospitals unless you're requiring the service or that you're, you're visiting loved ones and, and sick ones. And if you're an elder, um, it uh, behoves us to look at some form of either uh, sharing, cost sharing, or write off. And on that basis, you're looking at the wrong person, I think you should be talking to Winston Peters. Uh, the second issue, because it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a central government layoff uh, to that dollar, and at the moment the, the, the parking is between BHP and others, even though they've outsourced uh, management of Wilson's. The, uh, the second issue, which was the, um, what was the second issue called? Uh, the Auckland Council sort of taking over the whole parking operation for the city from a commercial oh, yeah, well, point of view and well, the regulatory point of view. Well, um, here's the problem. Um, I, think, I think Phil's already announced he wants to sell them. It's true, isn't it? Well, okay. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 words in your mouth. But I, I can, I'll, I'll definitely dig it out. Um, so uh, the, the management of parking downtown is part of uh, Auckland Transport using contractors to ensure there's less parking. And that's to ensure you get onto parking rides and into public transport. It's as simple as that. Just like they were going to ticket you for parking on Burns when you've got your family visiting you. It's just a money grab. And it's all designed to get people out of cars. And as I said, uh, you've got a decision to make between September the 20th and October the 13th. And you either vote for a mayor that's going to continue to allow that nonsense, or you're going to vote for a change. Okay, thanks, John. Do you like to comment, Phil? Um, look at, looking first at your second suggestion, taking over Wilson's and the other car parks. Well, if you've got hundreds of millions of dollars, you might be to buy them out. 
um, then and that's your priority, we could do it. But it's not, in my mind, a priority. Uh, Wilson's owns it. They make the money out of it. There's about four different parking uh, companies there. Some are, uh, are more extortionists than others. Uh, but we're not in a position to buy up parking buildings. Uh, we simply don't have the capital to do that. In terms of the hospitals, um, the three key hospitals, North Shore, Middlemore and Auckland, uh, all charge for parking. And we don't own that land. It's Crown land and it's run by the district health boards. So if you've got an issue with the parking and parking costs there, then you've got to talk to the people that own the land and that manage it. And it's certainly not council, so we're not in a position to do that. Let me just correct the uh, position on berms. Uh, yep, that was raised by the chair of the Waimata local board because a lot of people in her area complained bitterly when they mowed the lawns and somebody had come up in wet weather that we're having at the moment, parks on the car, chews it up, and there was no way that we could control that unless every 100 metres we put a sign saying no parking on the berms. So actually, it wasn't a money-making thing. It would not, I don't think it would go ahead because I don't think there's the support to do it. It requires central government legislation and local government New Zealand didn't support it. Uh, but it was driven by the fact that if you look after your burn, you don't want people parked on it, obstructing your, 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 your right of way um, or obstructing pedestrian crossings. So we can, we can control it in another way and that is uh, if there is um, problems time to game with people, uh, Recidivist parkers like that, we can put a sign up and then we can enforce it. Unless it's a sign up, we can't enforce it. Uh, but you know, you might not like a million orange cones, you'd probably like even less, um, you know, 10,000 don't park on the berm signs, and we're not about to do that. Uh, thanks, all. Um, where have we gone? Got, got a mic? Oh, and stand up. Yeah, I can stand up here. The statement was, high parking costs at North Shore Hospital continuing burden on public. Grey Power North Shore proposes that all the transport should be involved in the offsetting of hospital parking costs, with revenue they gain from street and parking building charging in the city, which is growing rapidly. Would I support this concept? Yes. I don't know why booms, I don't know why selling the car parks. You've asked the question, would I support it? Yes, I will. So let's work out a way to do it, rather than say no. Uh, thank you, John. Okay, probably the next item of the three specific questions was the rating relief for seniors. Uh, this is uh, now going to quite fly to a certain extent, but we've got what I call the grandfathering of rates. It's freezing the rate levels for rate payers at age 65, been residents for 20 years, the level they are at when they reach 65. The super gold card rating policy is quite common overseas in, in, in the States, Canada, and Australia. Such a policy recognises the contribution seniors have made over often a lifetime of financial contribution to the city and also the often limited income they face in retirement. An added factor which has been referred to with the current Auckland situation is the increasing rate levels are focused on future projects to cover the population increase that seniors will have minimum benefits from. And um, just whether that is a, could be a policy for Auckland City, so I'll probably start with, uh, with Colin, seeing you're sort of... Craig, sorry. I've, I've known Craig for years. <laughs> Just the senior moments. I went to amnesia, of course, uh, last week. It must be affecting you. I can't wait till Bill turns up and runs to be me next. <laughs> Grandfather, when you um, sent this to me, I hadn't heard of the term or the idea of it. And I had to read it at home multiple times, and I even had another read here, the grandfathering of rates, freezing the rate levels for rate payers at age 65 who've been residents for 20 years. The first thing I know is, oh, I've still got 20 years of rate paying to do. Um, and, well, yeah, I know how hard it is. Again, the question is, would I support a policy for Auckland City? I would certainly support having a damn good go at it. Why can't we just try why can't we, again, think tank, get the people together in the brain boxes, let's get a few smart accountants together, a few of you guys, we sit down and we nut it out and go, yes, this can work, or no, the idea is, no, it doesn't. We don't know until we just get into it. And I don't want to use working group as a term. 
Thank you. So, um, as you know, um, the prison has uh, issued a significant statement on rate increases in the city should be elected. Um, we're in the middle of an election campaign. Uh, I, I will be making a major announcement uh, on rates per se across the whole of the city uh, within the next wee while, and it's inappropriate for me to express that until the whole package is delivered as one policy suite. Having stated that, the only way uh, at this particular point in time, Auckland City's balance sheet is maxed out at 265% of debt. This mayor has left us with no ability, even if I wanted to, to arrive here and tell you what you wanted to hear. I don't get that ability to tell you what you want to hear, Bill. Because your, your credit card is three times over its limit and we've got some major difficulties, which is why I've got to rebalance the balance sheet. And I, I, don't, I, I can't be here and tell you porkies just to get a vote. So I'll just tell you straight, I just can't see in regard to our present debt loads uh, an ability to make this one work. <laughs> just let me brief a couple of those statements. Um, this council has the second highest credit rating of any organisation in New Zealand, second only for government. We get a clean bill of health every year from the Officer, officer of Auditor General. So I don't want any nonsense about we're maxed out on the credit card and you know we're, we're in real trouble. Our debt, our debt is $8.5 billion. Our assets are worth uh, $55 billion. Our debt as a percentage of our assets has gone down each year over the last three years. Those are the facts. You can see them in the, what, what, is, what, is, what is the, it's 16% uh, at the moment. Um, so that's pretty clear. The facts are there, it's set out in the report. Let's not invent facts, let's work on the basis of facts. There are two reasons why I don't support, and I said to, it, to you last time, and I said to you in another meeting, I regularly meet with Craig Power, it's a very useful meeting, we meet a couple of times a year, Bill, and I appreciate the opportunity. But one, um, I want to talk about equity. I'm like a lot of people in this room, I've worked in the life, paid in Texas, etc., but I live mortgage free. My housing costs aren't too bad. My kids, all three of them, are probably paying between five and seven times their household income to pay their mortgage. Do you think I can really look them in the eye and say, kids, I'm going to get a rate freeze, but your rates will keep going up and you'll be subsidising me? Is that fair? Really? Could you look your kids and grandkids in the eyes and say that? Yes. Well, okay, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can't, and you've got a different view, and uh, I respect that. But you know, one uh, that would either that would cut down, and over time, obviously, because if it's frozen at year one when you turn 65, when you're 85, you're still paying the rates that you would have been paying 20 years earlier. Uh, you are losing a massive amount of rates that would either have to come from cuts in what you can provide in the way of services, or would have to be loaded on to other people. So. I'll tell you answers that sometimes you won't like, but I'll tell you the honest answer and my perspective on it. We would not do that uh, because of equity reasons and because of the cost of the policy. If you were going to do it at all, actually I'd do it a different way. I'd look at what the government does in terms of rate rebates, which, uh, you know, they, they adjust it and then for the next 20 years they don't adjust it. Uh, I'd be looking at adjusting rate rebates or getting the government to do that in order to help those that are under real pressure. But we cannot be in the business of subsidising that section of the community um, where, where people have got good incomes and, and low outgoings. There is no fairness in that. Okay, thank you, Phil. We have to apply the old pipe. Phil's got to leave a little early, so I'll just... Send a message to say I'm going to be a bit late. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, okay, well, I'll just, just float one of our, our little sort of our own great uh, submissions we made to Auckland Council about the Auckland uh, Primary School Music Festival. That's a festival that's run in Auckland for all the second uh, primary schools. It's been going for 43 years. There's 4,000 kids all go to the town hall and send their little hearts out. And then last year, the, or the year before, um, the RFA put their rent up from 30 
um, 30,000 a year to 90,000 a year across two years. And of course, we got involved in that and it went on to uh, national radio. And uh, it was sponsorship was arranged. But the key concept we're putting forward as a policy point was that the, there should be a fund for the Auckland uh, Primary School Music Festival and the Santa Parade, another item that was cut down by the the AT, um, so that um, uh, these things get a viable and, and, and function. So we put that for as a formal submission this year, that they sort of do in fact do that, uh, give a sort of a rebate to do these sort of organisations. Uh, we haven't heard back, which is part of the uh, council process and a $40 million budget, and you're asking for 30,000 free access to the town or disappear. So i just like to sort of ask Phil whether we in fact could check that and ensure that the primary school music festival does in fact get a fair deal out of the, um, the renting for the town hall. I'll ask everybody, of course. Yeah, thanks, Phil, and thanks for giving me the notice of it and sending me the background. I did check it out. Um, the Auckland Primary Schools Music Festival is getting a community rate, a discounted rate. Um, that is a confidential agreement between them and RFA. Uh, the primary schools are still running. They, 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 well, they, they take the town hall for two weeks, sometimes a bit longer. So it's a substantial period of time. And normally we would be hiring that out at a commercial rate if there was a demand for it, uh, and people would be paying twice as much. But they are getting a community rate. And I understand, uh, well, I understand from the fact that the primary schools haven't approached me about there being a problem, that they've now reached uh, an agreement satisfactory to them about it. I'm fully in favour of the I see the kids there, and it's, uh, they also use the RT Centre, and it's fantastic, and we should be encouraging that. The other thing you asked me about um, was the Santa Parade. And the Santa Parade, um, AT was going to stop the funding of it. I go on the walking school bus each Santa Parade. I remember it when I was a kid. You probably remember it when you were kids, and then you took your kids. Now you're taking your grandkids. It's a, it's a great event. And what we've done is uh, AT says it doesn't fit their policy. Fine. We've taken off. AT in its budget, the amount of money that they were paying to the Santa Parade, back to council, and we paid that money directly to the Santa Parade. So we're continuing that support for it, and so we should, it's a great event. I really enjoy it, you know, just watching those kids, and it's really, really special. So we've protected them, and I think we've got a reasonable deal for the secret primary Thank you. One comment, John? Yeah, um, what, what the mayor's just expressed is he's got two C CEOs out of control. Uh, RT and, and its facilities group. And unless you've got control of your children who happen to be owned by you as a shareholder, these issues will continue to crop up. The um, taking away of um, the Santa Parade was just, was just a Auckland city, but it was also a national disgrace. And so when you've got a CCO that will actually attack one of our prime one of our prime investment envelopes, which is the Great Santa Parade, over used to call farms and all, all, all that to the core. But the point is, no, no, these major ones are driven deep into our DNA as uh, Aucklanders. And Santa Parade is a part of that. And the day of the CCR, and then what he says, he's got to, he has to ask them for the money to take it back to the parent and then give it to the, to, to the Santa Parade. That, that, that just won't happen on my watch. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I said it in my opening stump speech, the CCOs, they've become their own empire building, they're into their realm, they want to be over everyone and it's absolutely wrong, they're doing it to Western Springs, they're doing it to uh, Mount Wellington, they've done it to a roller park down in the south, they're doing it to a uh, archery place out in South Auckland that they've decided a zip line would be much better, so they've kicked the archery out and said, well, the zip line's going to pay more, so we'll take them. So that community's gone. It's how the CCOs work. And that's because there are no elected representatives working there. I don't know if we can change that in the laws, but I'll have a really good try and find out. We need to sit down with the lawyers and find out how do we get councillors on these places so that that rubbish doesn't happen anymore. We've got a third question, but I think we might just look at the support for senior organisations itself and the senior organisers struggling and 
I'm going to have a good view on that. I'd like just to wait there for you know, a few questions from the floor. Um, so, just over, over here. Uh, have you got the mics there, um, just this gentleman here? Just a bit of spice. And, and shorten the seat. Yeah. Well, just a, a, a question with a very brief comment. Um, I've got uh, a very quick question followed by another one, and it will depend on what you say for the answer for the first question. Our family's been in Takapuna paying rates for over 100 years, so I think I do have the right to speak today because it is a democracy. Well, I, it's not the right to speak. It's not the right Well, sorry. Okay, right. What I would like to know, Mr. Goff, um, to do with the ANZAC car park area that you are selling off, could you please tell me what you have now built a new car park building with the money that you were going to use to build the new car park building? Could you please tell me, are you going to use that money from the car park building, the new car park, will that remain in Takapuna? Will it be given to the Takapuna Devonport Board to use to invest back into Takapuna? Yes or no, please? Look, the answer is, um, I don't know what the, whether they charge or whether it's free to tell you through, wouldn't have a clue, but I can tell you this, that when we did, looked at Anzac car park, we said that's in the heart of the most, one of the most beautiful seaside centres in the, in, the, in the country, probably in the world. We can find answer, the yes or no answer, no, please. No, just Sorry, let, me, let me answer your question. First of all, yes, we said there's a better use of the car parking and we're going to create the Anzac Square. And we went out and we talked to your, your, your friends and your neighbours and your colleagues. We surveyed them under Colmar Brunton. We took the submissions and overwhelmingly, those submissions supported the council's actions. We have replaced. Well, you can say that. You can say that. You are speaking. I'm answering the question. Yes or no? Excuse me, would you please speak to the council? Yes or no? 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 Yes but you can see the evidence for yourself in the submissions that were put forward by your local community and by the Colmar Brunton poll that the majority of people wanted that made into the Anzac Square. We've done that and we have already replaced the parking that was being taken out to make a square with the gasometer site, which is, I've walked from the gasometer site to Park Takabuna, it's only a couple of hundred yards, a couple of hundred metres. And that will provide the parking. And that is what the majority of the people in your community wanted. I turned up in this room to a group of people who were against it. Yes, there are different views in the community. That often happens in a democracy. Sorry, but the, the majority go. view that we received back, that Panuku received back, was that they wanted that to go ahead, and that was supported by the two ward councillors as well. I am asking you, and I'll ask you again. Okay, that's please. enough on that issue, I think. Could you please know. tell me, is the money going to stay in Takapuna? Will it be reinvested back in the There place? is more money that will go into Takapuna than will come from the sale of any of the land that pays for the development that occurs there, yes. In fact, if you ask the people in Monaco, they say, why are they losing money because there's sale of property in Monaco and we're putting more money into Takapuna and to North Carolina. Well, what worries the people of Takapuna, Mr. Goff, is you are selling... No, look, sorry, we could you please finish there. Yes, no, 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 you're no, selling no, off no, car parks, yeah. you're selling off the car park buildings, the and the money will go south. I'm sorry, I'm in the hands of the chair. I'm happy yes, to no, we're, we're, we're familiar with the issue, we've got an answer. Now, Trish, my Trish, Bench, uh, oh, okay, you've got a question? Okay, uh, is this working? Yeah. Is that on? Uh-oh. Uh, just speak right into it. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Dave, would you help Trish with the mic? Dave, where? Oh, no, I've got it. Oh, got it. Okay. A different question uh, to Phil. In 2016, you promised us that uh, no more extension into the ports. Um, then we found out later on there would be an extension. I'm not sure where you're at what we're doing uh, with the extension on the ports. Uh, if you look at the, the article on the front page of the Herald, uh, Trish, that was there on Saturday, you'll see what I'm trying to do. Um, first of all, 
I don't agree that the best use of the port's land at Bladersloe and Captain Cook is to store cars that have been uh, loaded from there. And of course, when you take those cars out, the, the cars and the containers is a thousand uh, uh, truck movements a day out of the port that adds some congestion. Um, the ports were a little reluctant to change. I talked to a group of people that take a lot of the cars off the port now, 80% of the used cars, and they've got, uh, they've got premises in Highbrook. And they said, we can barge the truck, the, the cars, straight off the wharf, and we can take them up to Highbrook. We remove the congestion, we'll have electric barges, we remove the pollution, and we can do it economically. I, I can't direct the ports under the Port Companies Act, but I can ask them, and they have agreed, that they will fully look at that option, because that option, to come back to Trisha's question, then frees up a lot of the space on Bledisloe Wharf, which can be used then for cruise liners, rather than having to put the concrete mooring buoy, the dolphin, off Queen's Wharf. And that's what I'd prefer to do. You haven't raised the car park on the wharf that they built now. Uh, no, I didn't. Don't you see, you're wrong. You're, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong. I don't have the right to approve or disapprove that. Under, under, no, if you want, okay, do you want an answer to the question? I'll, I'll give you the answer. The answer is that was a decision made by the ports, and they have the right to make that decision, and I have no right to instruct them. That's under the Board Companies Act. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil. John, would you like to comment? I, I did want to respond to that. Um, leadership is required in the city. The ports is owned by the citizens. This mayor appoints the chairperson. He points, he points, this guy, look, I'll put it to you this way. The day that he uh, does not consent, right? If he does not consent to the appointment of uh, boards across the CCOs, including the boards, he's not, look, he's not um, without uh, influence, is what I'm saying. He's not without influence. <laughs> His, no, no, but like you said last election, you said last election, not one more metre of concrete into the port. What? And there is. That's what the dolphins are. Uh, in fact, it's gone from 12 million to 90 million dollars. But the question that you raise is very important. That's why the port has to be brought back under control of the citizens, and it's very important. You can't have a mayor that says, oh, I'm hands off, I have no influence. That's not true. Okay. The, the issue about Pamuku, uh, about the dollars from Takapuna, you know, no, the money's not coming back. It goes downtown, they work out the little algorithm downtown, and then they make the distribution, and that's part of a CCO where he does appoint. Now, not only does he appoint chairs and, and the boards of everyone else but uh, ports, he then has to give them a letter of expectation. He then has to keep on top of them, but he clearly hasn't. So, so to suggest that the CCOs are out there without any control from the mayoralty it's just hogwash. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, question? Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yeah. Okay. The board is not a CCO. Yeah. That's okay. fundamentally wrong. I don't have that power. No mayor has ever had that power. Okay, that's clear. Okay, Alan McCulloch. How do I get a job with Colm Lundgren? No, that, 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being, I'm being pursued. Like um, how much is the uh, the boss of Panuki? You know, Panuki's that outfit that, without our consent, stole all the properties. That we paid for. How much? How much is his yearly salary plus site perks? Of course, don't forget about them. But how much is he paid? I know. I know. Okay. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> $570,000 a year. Okay, thank you. And if you wonder where our money goes, he's not the only one. Oh, sorry. You're next. You're next. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. I was a lady right behind you at the back. Never mind. You've got the mic. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm sorry. I feel very sorry for our local board. They take all the flack for all the local problems from traffic to parking to rubbish to development and they have absolutely no 
powers of any sort, and what's more, they're treated arrogantly by your CTOs, particularly for and AT, who don't even tell them what they're doing until the citizens jump up and down and say what is going on. They're frequently run... <laughs> run my local board members and ask them what's happening, and they say, you know more than me. Have you got any plans to devolve some powers back to the local boards, um, change the model, because it is certainly not working at the moment. Okay. Yeah, we are currently um, starting with Waikiki, piloting a program to see what further powers could be devolved to the local board level that are local, that, that are over local decisions rather than regional decisions. If you devolve regional decisions down, then you'd end up back where we were with, uh, we'd have, except we'd have 21 local councils. We are a very decision, well, you know, that decision, that decision was made nine years ago, and it was made by Parliament and the Government of the day, and if you don't like that decision, you take it up with Parliament and the Government of the day. But what I'm saying to you is regional decisions need to be made regionally, but local decisions can be made locally, and when we can devolve more decisions that are purely local to local boards, then we'll do so. The Brown Flag Car Park. Huh? Yeah, Brown Flag Car Park, if I recall that, um, was used almost exclusively by, was it Countdown? Um, no, 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 no. Do, you want, do you want an answer on it? The answer is that my, my recollection of it was that it was used almost exclusively and this is the information given to me, by the, the supermarket, its staff and its clientele, and it was sold to the supermarket in order that they pay for their own parking, for their own staff and their own customers, and the money comes back to spend uh, on better things that we can do for the rest of you as Aucklanders. Okay, well, that's, that's, what I, that's, my, that's, my, that's my understanding of it. You can, you can correct me if you like. Uh, thank you, Craig. Yeah. You are correct. The CCOs need fixing. We need to sit down with the legal teams, central, whoever it is that makes the decisions on how they're created, and we find out how to make them work properly. Because at the moment they're not. How to get rid of them? Yeah, look, it'd be lovely to get rid of them. It'd be lovely to kick all them out and start again. But we can't just put a pen through and do it. We've got to go through the right processes. There'll be employment contracts. Can you imagine if we broke those? Oh, then we'll go bankrupt. The city will be a disaster. It'll go bankrupt. So we've got it structurally. But yes, I agree. The CCOs are a serious problem. And I've had emails and private messages virtually every day from different people around the city saying, have you seen what Panuku have done? Have you seen what RFA are doing? It, it, I, can, I can't keep up with the complaints. So yes, we must get in there and try and find out how it works. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn, back. My name is Lynn Dawson and my question is to the three of you and it is sort of around the same area. What would your council do to give more autonomy to the local boards who actually know and understand the needs of their communities? To let those local boards work with the community and not have to bow and scrape to the likes of Panuku who step in where they don't have a place. In particular, I refer to De in Devonport to the community use of a historic building at number three Victoria Road, where volunteers, mostly seniors, established a very successful information centre in 2017, welcoming 22,000 plus guests in the first year of operation. Panuku evicted the information centre and two other community groups, and this historic building, against the wishes of the local board, has now sat vacant and dilapidated for more than 400 days. In 1918, a 1,000-plus petition of locals was presented to both the local board and the Heritage Panel of Auckland Council, to no avail, and it seems that that petition has been buried. The once successful information centre is now poked into an arcade where no one can find it, 
and guest turn-up is down by more than 70%. Once again, our guests are stopping locals in the street for information in this historic precinct. What is the point of funding 21 local boards if Auckland Council won't listen to the needs of the communities? I do note that with some probably pressure because of this current election, Panuku is now calling for expressions of interest in the short-term use of this building. As well as the information centre being reinstated to the space, my conversations within the community know that there is constant community use waiting for this space. How long is this bureaucratic process going to take? And I would also like to suggest to Auckland Council that they recognise that the North Shore in particular Devonport is not an island, as AT seems to think that it is. There is not one tourist map produced by AT that shows the North Shore of Auckland attached to Auckland Central Business District. Thank you. Look, Panuku was standing last year. Panuku is the worst performed property company in any comparative terms, given it seizes on the most strategic, important and expensive realty in Auckland. And over the last 10 years, its returns to the rate payer have been disgraceful. And if you were to do a comparison on a peer review with Kiwi Property Trust. Now, how can that be? How can that be? I was in Howick debating Mr. Goff last Saturday the same question over the Howick Library. Panuku has not bought it for five years and it was used as a community centre. They've left the windows open so it can dilapidate so they can now say no one's allowed in there. Now this has to stop. These are uh, rate payers, these are rate payers, rightful entitlements to be expressed within them. So Panuku is another one that's out of control. His response is, I'm going to run another million dollar review. Another million dollar review. Then no one will get to read it. And then it won't be executed. I've indicated that what's going to happen to Auckland Transport when I get downtown, and the next uh, CCO that will be taken to with Genola will be Panuku. Panuku is, um, there's something radically wrong with a number of deals they have done. And my integrity unit will be exploring that in great depth. That's point one. And the final thing I'll say about uh, Parliament is the executives there, as you have rightly said, are overpaid because they don't deliver a return on investment for the ratepayers. Okay, John, we're running out of time. Uh, thank, thank you for that. I'm not familiar with the eyesight and the, the changes that were made there. Uh, it does concern me if you were asked to leave from that site and then the building was left empty. That doesn't make sense to me at all. Uh, if you'd just like to send me a quick email on that, uh, I'll try to find some more information out for you. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, Panuku. Panuku are property developers. Panuku. How cool would it be if you had a company that property develops for you and the citizens paid your wages?
for Heritage. She is standing here like the board with the board paper cream of the and I would certainly endorse it. We don't endorse anybody for me, but I'd just like you to consider it. <laughs> Thank you.